Hey, everybody. Good morning and welcome back. It's so nice to see all of you, all of your fresh faces on a nice morning like today. It's very overcast here and I hear the woman downstairs yelling at her granddaughter. So it's a very, very cheery, positive environment. Um, but we're going to discuss something that's much more positive and optimistic and uplifting, and that's the story of Latin America and reform and recovery after the post-independence period. And as you know, we are comparing Latin America to Africa, and there's a lot there. It's a really useful comparison, even though the time frames are radically different. And what we've done so far this week is discuss the post-independence period in Latin America and the post-independence period in Africa. <clears throat> we've been focusing on how disorder and illegality and chaos and war and conflict and depression characterize those periods and how it was really a period of lawlessness and disorder into a long period of conflict that preceded eventual state building and sort of recovery. And what we'll do today and Friday is continue to compare Latin America and Africa. And we'll start to talk more about reform and recovery and growth and the potential future of Africa and what the development trajectory might look like depending upon what happens today. And this is a very useful discussion because we get to not only discuss the experiences of two very large regions of the developing world, but we also get to put to use some of the perspectives and ideas that we've been discussing in the class. Before we get started today, I wanna do something a little bit different. And that is just ask you a simple question. Uh, what did you learn from the reading? that you did for this week by Bates and others. What did you pick up when you did that reading? I thought it was similar to the reading that we did about um, the slave trades in Africa. I believe it was the reading by Nunn um, because it spoke about how the colonial times has affected each region's development. So there's certainly an, imp uh, an, an important role for the colonial legacies, the patterns that were set in motion during the colonial period, the institutions that were set down and left behind, the policies that were put in place, certainly. So there's that historical component and the post-independence period is characterized by conflict in both places because the colonizers really quite arbitrarily drew the boundaries and the borders. And as a result, there wasn't really a rhyme or a reason or an order a, or a coherence to the national territories and the groups of people that they put together. And as a result, there was a lot of conflict and disorder in the period immediately after independence in both places. And to some degree still today in Africa, those divisions remain quite tense. And even in places where they've set up ethnic party systems and other institutions designed, to mitigate some of the tensions that arise around those divisions, uh, sometimes the ethnic party systems themselves can become quite explosive. Does anyone else wanna comment on what they learned about the reading and what they learned in completing the reading? <clears throat> 
Let's hear from one more person before we continue. This is a reminder everyone that that reading is assigned. It's not optional, it's not voluntary. If you show up to lecture, the expectation is that you completed the reading. I always arrive with a presentation, but I count on you to help constitute the discussion and the engagement with this material. And there's only so much we can accomplish if I'm the only one who shows up in that regard. So I count on you and I'm expecting more from you. And Yelly says the social cost of Latin America was high and it created inequality, but they, they emerged and it said that Africa can experience the same. Thank you, Anna Yelly. This is absolutely right. And that's a nice way of putting the big picture in a few words. Eventually, Latin America was able to emerge from that period of conflict and depression. But even when they did, they were only able to develop democratic institutions for a very narrow slice of the population. And they were only able to grow the economy for a very narrow slice of the population. So the impoverished masses remained impoverished, inequality increased, oligarchs remained and became more powerful. And although eventually Caudillos were replaced with elites and political elites and politicians, there wasn't much in the way of broad-based development, development that could be shared equally. And in that regard, some of the patterns of inequality in the continuation of poverty today can be understood as historical and as resulting from Latin America's initial sort of emergence in the way that from the very beginning, those benefits were not shared uh, equally, but were concentrated in the hands of a few. And this sort of a pattern as a reminder is probably vindication for those who argue that institutions left behind by colonizers help to explain contemporary development patterns. Because remember that much of Latin America was left with very extractive institutions and it can be difficult to develop democratic, high quality political institutions on a foundation that was set up uh, to strengthen the rule of the elites and to concentrate power in the hands of, of, a, of a narrow slice. And so that foundation may have inhibited broad-based development, but it didn't prevent economic growth at all. And so it is complicated, and we will talk about how that pattern was eventually set in motion and how the limits of that development meant that it wasn't shared equally, the benefits, the fruits. Anna says the article had a pretty positive perspective for the future of Africa, but I think that that was too hopeful because there is still a lot of civil conflict today. Anna makes a good point. I was actually wondering the same thing. You know, to Annielli's comment, how do the authors know that Africa has reached this branching point? How are we sure actually that they've begun to emerge? Some countries certainly have, like Ethiopia, uh, Uganda, 
And there's a lot of variation from country to country in terms of the prospects for development. But it's not clear that the continent as a whole has emerged in the way that Latin American countries have, since most Latin American countries have, have emerged at least as middle income countries. So I don't know if it is true that Africa is at that sort of fork in the road that the authors suggest that they are. And Anna makes the point that I was thinking all along, which is, I don't know if it's appropriate to consider that they're at that stage and not, not because cer certain African countries haven't made spectacular efforts to develop and reduce poverty. It's just that there's a lot of work to be done. And remember that independence was achieved in 1960. And so for most of these countries, they haven't had nearly the experience with post-independence development that Latin American countries have, considering that 1810 was the year of independence for most Latin American countries. So we're working with the historical perspective. We're thinking about long periods of time. We're thinking about institutions and patterns and processes that were set in motion and that are difficult to reverse. And that once in motion, uh, gain momentum and tend to feed on themselves because of the way that they produce that positive feedback uh, that we talked about before. So I'm going to make that one, that comment one more time, everyone. Uh, I do expect you to be better prepared. And those of you who do arrive prepared and contribute, I appreciate that very much. But I expect all of you to be engaged in this way. And I think that your experience and your outcome will be much better if you do that. So please uh, arrive prepared to contribute and, and discuss the reading at bare minimum. Let's return to Latin America and talk about the emergence of Latin America and the, the sort of flowering of this, this incipient independent region. In 1810, remember that these places won independence, but they didn't have even a modicum of stability or order. They didn't have a constitution. In fact, in most cases, independence was won by a ragtag collection of, of, of fighters who claimed to represent um, these places, but didn't really represent a state or an organization that could begin to concentrate or consolidate power. And so for 50 or 60 years in Latin American countries up today, wars and conflicts raged and those caudillos, those military strongmen really became pivotal figures they were the ones who were able to um, establish some order. They were able to control the guns and the ones who controlled the guns were the ones who, who held the power. And it was until about 1860 or 1870 that this kind of lawlessness and disorder um, and, and the rule of the caudillos characterized the, the region. But in the 1860s, the 1870s, the, the, the balance of power began to to tilt. And what began to happen was a, a transformation, an economic transformation. And slowly but surely, the export economy began to grow and began to uh, expand. And it had always been there to the extent that these places had always relied on commodity production, owing to patterns from colonialism and in, in the foundations of the economy set in place then. By 1860 or 1870, the growth of the export economy was, was starting to eclipse the influence of the caudillos. And especially in the sense that the hacienda owners, the owners of the large plantations that owned much of the land were increasingly backing law and order in supporting the formation of state structures, uh, principally because they needed to facilitate and ensure the delivery of their goods. The caudillos couldn't be relied on to promote this kind of function because they needed a public service provision. They needed uh, infrastructure and, and transportation and, and something that could support an apparatus, an economic arrangement that would, that would guarantee the delivery of their goods. And so they began to support taxation, to support the construction of railroads <clears throat> and roads and telephone lines, the integration of the national economy and the revenue from the export taxes that the states imposed on the 
production of the hacienda owners was then invested in infrastructure and military units. And slowly but surely, over the course of the next century, Latin American countries began to develop economically. And the export economies really sort of sustained this economic growth. And remember that this is the period leading up to the period that would eventually turn into the ISI period. So we're kind of going back in time and we're doing this so that we can compare the emergence of Latin America to the emergence of, of Africa. And so in the emergence of Latin America, then those, those caudillos were eventually eclipsed by the export economy, the hacienda owners and their interests, the need for national integration, the formation of taxes, revenue from export taxes in their investment in infrastructure and the military, all of this work together to promote economic development. And so you saw sites like this, um, rapid economic expansion. This is Buenos Aires back in the day. And you can sense then that there's a lot of new infrastructure and growth. There is a role for ports and for urban investment and new services. And consumption, of course, is driving a lot of this as well. But remember that the export economy is relying principally on the global demand for commodities like, in the case of Argentina, beef and grain, agricultural products. And so it really becomes important to establish national infrastructure, ports, other kinds of arrangements that can facilitate export production and the movement of these commodities. And so it becomes really, really essential to begin to develop the state and to develop political institutions that can support the market and they can collect taxes and they can invest tax revenue in infrastructure and the military. So for the defense of property rights and, and so on and, and so forth. And so by 1913, for example, Argentina was richer than France and Germany. It was twice as rich as Spain. It was as rich as Canada measured in terms of GDP per capita. It was actually one of the richest countries in the world essentially based on exports of grain, cattle, other agricultural products in which Argentina had uh, an, an advantage. And this is the essence of the export economy. You know, the eventual extinction of the caudillos and the replacement with these political elites, these oligarchic landowning uh, hacienda owners and plantation owners who owned huge tracts of land and who essentially and increasingly relied on the state to protect their property uh, and who consented to taxation um, in return for, well, support of markets, ports, infrastructure, communications, everything that they needed to, to generate revenues and export their products and, and grow Argentina to become one of the richest countries in the world. And so this is where we are. Latin America did emerge in every sense of the, of the word. And in so much so that by this period of time, Argentina is one of the richest countries in the world. It's one of the largest economies in, in Latin America as well. I believe it is the largest in Latin America at the time. And all of this growth had an extraordinary impact on politics. Remember that in a class on political economy, we're interested in the interaction between political and economic forces. And so economic growth becomes an important cause in its own right of political change. And in Latin America, the situation was no different. The sustained growth over the period of the, of the late 18th century and early 19th century helped to support democratic institutions. Um, and in particular, competitive party systems, the enfranchisement of essentially white landowning males, um, and we'll discuss those limits here in a moment. And in general, the consolidation of, of democratic institutions that would help to create a foundation for um, at least a, a modicum of, of democratic experience, such that by the 1930s, countries like Chile in Argentina, primarily new democracy, 
although a, an attenuated form of democracy that, that was quite limited in terms of its scope in the freedoms that it extended to different groups. And so this economic growth did help to impact politics, but like its impact on the economy and its impact on inequality, it was a mixed bag. So politically, political exclusion tended to result from the growth of the export economy and the economic growth and development of these countries, mainly in the sense that political parties primarily represented um, landowning males or white males. Women were excluded, uh, indigenous people were excluded, um, other, others who of lesser status were excluded. Essentially, it was a very attenuated form of, of democracy. And this was a reflection of the inequality in the economy as well. All of this economic growth was not shared equally when it came to dispersing the fruits of that economic growth. In fact, much of the gains from the economic growth went to the top. Remember that in Latin America, the plantations were primarily owned by a very narrow, narrow slice of the elite. And they owned huge tracts of land. Much of the land ownership was concentrated in their hands. So they benefited from much of the growth. The export of grain and other commodities and beef and cattle in Argentina, for example, primarily benefited those large landowners, those large hacienda owners. And of course, there were positive impacts and other consequences of the growth and other services and industries that arose around them. But the fact is that that exponential economic growth mainly went to the top. And so the, the benefits were, were, were shared very, very narrowly by only a few. And, and so then we must ask ourselves, you know, economic growth and democracy for whom, right? What is the point of development if the social cost is so extraordinarily high that it doesn't actually trickle down and that it's only enjoyed by a narrow slice of the population? And if politics is liberalized and democratized, but only for those who are able to participate in the economy as landowners. It suggests that economic growth and the emergence that took place in Latin America was quite limited um, in, in terms of the impact in the, the broad-based sharing of the benefits, political and economic, that, that came from growth. I'm gonna pause and take a look at the chat because some of you have made comments. So this is actually a poster from Uruguay. And this is from the women's rights movement and in particular, the movement to enfranchise women and get them the vote. And this is from the early 20th century. And it's basically just showing that women in Latin American countries don't have the right to vote, nor do women in African countries Although women in the United States and Canada, Australia, European countries, elsewhere in Asia do enjoy that right. And this is just an example of how narrowly those political freedoms and, and rights generated by economic growth were shared. And it suggests that the social cost of economic growth was, was extremely high and that democracy and economic growth would only be enjoyed by some and, and not all. And this is an important lesson for us because it suggests that the process of development might be fundamentally different in developing countries, countries that aren't uh, comparable to the development and the history and the trajectory of say European or, or settler colonies that we've talked about. Those late developers appear to have a different experience. And this brings into question 
what will happen and what will take place in Africa and whether Africa will generate economic growth and democratic development for only some or for all and what direction African development will go based upon uh, all the different possibilities that we know exist given the experience of Latin American countries. And so I want to step back and have a discussion with you. And the questions that I'd like to post to you are as follows. They're on the screen and you can see them now. And the, the questions include, will Africa pay the same price for modern economic growth as did Latin America? Will growth also lead to rising inequality and an oligarchic elites consolidation of power? Or will those benefits be shared more equitably and more evenly? And maybe more generally, what kinds of policies and institutions would prevent or generate this outcome? And I'd like us to draw on all of our knowledge that we have from the class, everything that we've read, everything that we've seen and watched, everything that we've absorbed, and really just also draw on your intuition and your insight and what you think, what do you think? Would anyone like to comment or take on any of these questions? I would, I would like to uh, comment on this. Um, you know, one of the things that I think is interesting in the modern world is that we have China rebuilding uh, what they're calling the Silk Road, right? And especially through Africa, they have been developing and uh, say, quote, investing into the countries there. And I think that uh, as with Latin America, it's a little bit different, um, you know, a hundred years ago, the technologies and I would say the inequalities were greater back than what they are now because China is able to essentially jumpstart Africa's economy in a way that Latin America uh, was unable to um, in comparison. But has the Silk Road jumpstarted African economies? Uh, I wouldn't say necessarily yet. Um, I don't think it's even close to completion, but I believe that within 10 years, uh, China will definitely allow Africa to jumpstart its economy in a way that Latin America was unable to. I, I would say more equally, I, I guess, pending uh, civil wars um, that are happening in Africa, but I do believe that they will not pay the same price. Okay. Well, how would you respond to those who point out that, you know, some African countries have been forced to turn over ports in other critical infrastructure to China um, as a result of either uh, debt deals or as a result of like agreements around the Silk Road. What do you think about that? Uh, that is definitely happening. Um, that, that is a great point. Um, however, I, I just do believe that the countries will receive a greater benefit um, with the Chinese infrastructure as opposed to not having it whatsoever. Um. So it's interesting because in Latin America, it was the Hacienda owners and the, pl the plantation owners who spurred the creation of that infrastructure in those roads, railroads that Max is talking about in relation to the Silk Road. Now, for those of you who know less about this, and that may be many of you or all of you, um, and you'd be forgiven for that because it's one of those topics that might come up here and there, but unless you've read about it, you might not know much about it. The Chinese government has been investing huge resources in the construction of this Silk Road that would um, connect, see, see, forgive me, Max, because I even don't know that much about it, but that would connect basically um, a, a huge number of markets and would involve Africa and it would involve construction of a lot of infrastructure in Africa and some of the potential benefits include that it could facilitate and foster the construction of economic infrastructure that African countries don't have like we saw for instance that Mozambique only has like three railroads and they all come from the colonial era and they were set up to cut the country in thirds to facilitate the extraction of, of natural resources and ship the minerals back to, to Europe. The examples like that highlight the need for infrastructure in Africa. China is engaged in the construction of this Silk Road. And 
one potential benefit could be the construction of this new infrastructure and, and the use of it to generate new economic activity in Africa and, and generate new wealth and, and construct new mar markets, et cetera. And that could all be great. But there also are some potential drawbacks that come from the, the leverage that China may gain over these African countries and that many analysts suspect China might want to gain over these countries, you know, in return for um, China constructing these, these, these bridges and roads and this infrastructure, these countries are often forced or asked to give up control of critical infrastructure or ports uh, or to cede to certain Chinese demands. And so all of this is really interesting because A, it highlights that Africa might be quickly developing the kinds of infrastructure that Latin America did when hacienda and plantation owners supported the construction of, of infrastructure and, and supported taxation in the development of political institutions and state institutions so that they could support and protect their markets and, and support uh, uh, the export of, of agricultural products. Uh, in Africa, that same infrastructure is, is being built apparently by, by China. And so I guess the question would be, you know, if not for China, it, are there domestic private actors or are there actors in African countries that have identified an interest in constructing this infrastructure? It was the hacienda and the plantation owners in Latin America. Is there a similar set of actors in Africa? And I think one concern I would have as a policymaker or as a technocrat in a in an African country is, you know, is there anyone outside of, of China who has taken a, an interest in developing Africa? Are there, are there Africans who are interested in developing Africa? And is there a, a, an economic actor or a group of actors who could support uh, or underwrite or authorize or call for or legitimate or give momentum to the development of this infrastructure domestically as opposed to externally through China. And I think that the question still remains for any of you who want to take it on, is it possible for Africa to grow economically and develop ra rapidly in a sustained way without creating rising inequality, without paying a high price, you know, without developing undemocratic politics and exclusive authoritarian institutions? Is it possible to escape that fate or do you anticipate that Africa will also wind up with the same outcome? So to talk about one of the points you made earlier about who is interested in the development of Africa, um, by 20, or this is a weird year, 2100, Africa will have grown a ton. I think Nigeria's population is about 200 million now. And by the end of this century, it's supposed to be about 800 million. And that's like that same level of growth is supposed to occur throughout the rest of the continent. So there's a lot of the superpowers understand that a lot of the worlds will go through Africa in the future. Um, but if I was African, I would definitely not want foreign influence in my development unless I could take advantage of them. So, I so about two years ago, African countries agreed to the African Continental Free Trade Area, uh, which is just like a big free trade agreement similar to the EU. And I think that is a possible way to go forward to help uh, develop Africa further. Good, thank you, Matt. Number of important points there. First of all, as Matt points out, countries like Nigeria, um, Ethiopia, for that matter, too. Population growth, more robust than anywhere else on Earth, right? These, are, these places are growing faster demographically than anywhere else on Earth. 
That is true. But in terms of capital formation, in terms of investment, in terms of like fixed capital, there's just not a lot of investment and they do represent enormous markets and there is a huge potential for consumption and growth. But I just don't know if there's like a corollary, if there's like an African version of like the Hacienda owners or the plantation owners in Latin America who, while being oligarchs, nevertheless had a clear interest in supporting state and market development, right? I just don't know if those same actors exist in Africa, certainly the markets will continue to grow and these countries will continue to get larger and larger. Matt's point about the formation of a free trade union within Africa, definitely probably a good step, right? Facilitates free trade. Uh, but I have to say, I think that one challenge is still facilitating and fostering investment. And I think that's why countries like Botswana have it figured out. Now, Botswana, what have they done? Well, first of all, they do primarily rely on exporting natural resources. It's just they invest almost all of the revenue from that in the domestic economy, in capital formation, in skills, education, in factories. They've got a lot of state enterprises. They're very, very careful about what they do with their revenue from exports and they use export taxes carefully. The state is heavily involved in steering investment and in facilitating investment and they are heavily engaged in channeling large, large shares of, of, of the return from the export of natural resources. And I can't remember what they primarily export, but they're investing like 25% in a given year. And so very high rates of investment, but look, it's the state that's involved in doing that, right? There's not necessarily a private actor driving that process. That's a set of political decisions made by the Botswana government. Those are political decisions. That's what makes Botswana unique, and that pattern doesn't really replicate itself elsewhere. Ethiopia is a case, a case that we discussed earlier in the semester, and we talked about rapid growth, educational attainment, literacy. My guess, if I was a betting man, is that educational attainment, literacy, rapid social development in places like Ethiopia, Kenya, large youth populations, high rates of educational attainment by youth. This will drive innovation and investment in, this, in the next subsequent decades. That's what I think will happen in Africa. And I think that much of that will be driven forward by domestic actors, I hope. Like Matt, I don't think that Chinese investments in the Silk Road are the key to Africa's future. I think that they can find the initiative and the momentum and channel the resources domestically to do that. It's just that where they are in that process of development is sort of an open question. And that's what I'd like us to really grapple with for the rest of the week as we continue discussing this. You know, where is Africa in this process? Will a price be paid for economic growth? Um, what will that price be? And will more or less inequality result? <clears throat> and then also, similarly, how will all of this affect politics? I would suggest that the international environment today is less favorable to dictatorship and illiberal democracy than it was in the early 20th century in 1913. Even though there are more dictatorships the world over today than there were 10 years ago, I still think that um, the international environment has changed. And so 
the future may not be dim for Africa, both politically and economically. Some comments in the chat here. Ernie's got a number of comments that I'm gonna uh, summarize here. Ernie says it's possible for them to grow, but it will be very difficult because of authoritarian regimes and how they deal with public policies. Um, interesting, so Ernie's clearly linking some of the political impediments to development. He's talking a lot about authoritarian regimes and how the politics in many of these countries just don't support growth and stability of the kind that we would hope for. And Ernie continues and says that um, most policies benefit the elite, not the rest of the population. And so this is a really good point that Ernie makes here, which is that, look, the way the decisions are made in many of these countries at the highest levels of government, it benefits the elites primarily and it doesn't really support and promote broad-based development, social and economic development enjoyed by all. And this is a really important point because it gets to the heart of what we're discussing this week in the case of the African countries and that is patrimonialism. And patrimonialism is basically a type of rule where the ruler does not distinguish between personal and public issues, does not distinguish between personal and public finances, does not distinguish between personal and public resources. And going along with this often is a tendency to favor certain groups or certain elites who are in the inner circle of the regime, who are part of the oligarchic elite, whose support is essential to the survival of the regime and the continued grip on power of the ruler or the ruling group. This tendency to rule in a patrimonial way has been synonymous with African politics. And really the study of patrimonialism has been the study of African politics. This tendency to blur the lines between public and private or personal and in, in public. And what this means in practice in African countries is selecting successors and selecting leaders based on familial and blood relations, what we would refer to as nepotism. And then the principle of reciprocal, reciprocal, excuse me, altruism, or, you know, you, you scratch my back, I scratch yours type of thing. The good old boys network, the network of favors, these principles of kin selection and reciprocal favoritism go hand in hand with patrimonialism and this type of rule that fails to distinguish between personal and private or public and private. And in Africa, the single most dominant pattern in politics since independence has been patrimonial rule. And in particular, the emergence of these personalistic ruling presidents who may or may not be democratically elected, but always wind up staying in power and holding on to power, either undemocratically or with the support of a narrow group of supporters. And those supporters are kept happy through benefits and favors doled out to them, through the appointment of 
individuals to key posts in government, through contracts and royalties, handouts, sweeteners of all kinds. This politics of patrimonialism is really the defining feature of African politics since independence. It's the main reason that African presidential regimes have remained authoritarian because of the, of the persistence of these personal regimes in the support enjoyed by these ruling presidents, primarily as a result of patron-client relationships set up around, around patrimonial rule. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna discuss examples of patrimonialism and we're gonna evaluate the impact on development. And we're gonna think about what the course of African development tells us about patrimonialism and about whether it creates a, a possibility of development or if it's always inherently bad. And so we'll start out by looking at some examples of patrimonial rule. And we'll consider how the examples from Africa um, sort of dovetail with some of the challenges experienced in Latin America. And while these challenges are, are different, um, I would suggest to you that we could still think about these experiences in terms of the political obstacles or the economic obstacles to full development. So the case of Sierra Leone is one of the most infamous examples of patrimonial politics and, and patrimonial development. And this is because the first two presidents, Siaka Stevens, who ruled from 1971 to 1985, and Joseph Sedu Moma, who ruled from 1985 to 1992, were intensely personalistic. They basically personalized public finances. There was no distinction between private and public cash, and they would essentially use the public accounts as their personal accounts. And they would illegally um, acquire luxury cars and properties, and they would use these to patronage their clients and retain the support of their inside clique members. Those insiders were those narrow elites, those oligarchic elites uh, whose support was essential to remain in power, um, but who didn't represent the rest of society by any stretch. And Sierra Leone is a good example of patrimonial rule because of just how intensely these presidents um, essentially colonized and, and privatized the, the public finances and used the, the public purse for their own personal purposes. And they would select family members to fill posts. They would use patronage and reciprocal altruism to favor and benefit key private actors and oligarchs and elites whose support was necessary uh, for them to remain in the good graces of, of the real power brokers in the country. And these examples of patrimonial rule um, had a predictably disastrous impact on development the absolute plundering um, of, of the public purse, the, the theft of the, of the public uh, accounts, it, it leaves the state institutions and the organs of the state completely unable to deliver basic public services. And moreover, the delivery of public services can itself become contingent on, on patrimonial and patron-client relationships in your relation to the, the ruling elite or the inside group. And these examples um, are par for the course as far as patrimonial rule and developmental um, consequences are concerned in Africa. This is the, the situation in country after country in Africa post-independence, this difficulty um, establishing clean politics in the absolute personalization of, of public finances by these sorts of figures. We're gonna have to end this for today and we'll finish this lecture up on Friday and we'll continue to compare Latin America and Africa and we'll also be considering the question of of developmental patrimonialism and if there's a third way that doesn't involve uh, corruption.
So thanks very much. Thanks, thanks so much, everybody, for being here. I can't speak today. Uh, I'll see you on Friday. Thank you, Professor. Thanks, Max. Have a good one.